Hello. Cool. cool. Hi guys. Uh, so, <laughs> so I've got. I, I was working on like a personal project a long time ago, and the time has come to share it with people. Um, so it's still. You'll, you'll see as we go along. So, the kind of the. Is that going to work? Click. There we go. Cool. So uh, a while ago, it was about two years ago, I stumbled across this article on Ars Technica, and it was talking about how some kind of big pharma company is spending the, like. They ran a massive cluster on EC2 for about seven hours. It cost them not an awful lot of money, and then they kind of destroyed it. And this kind of piqued my interest, because at the time, like, EC2 was becoming more and more of a thing. I had an account for there, and I thought, actually, the, the, it, I could get my hands on a cluster of that size if I could afford it um, without having to go and buy a server farm and all the hardware and all that kind of stuff. Um, so. They quote, their article was embarrassingly parallel, but regardless, I, I plowed ahead and I started thinking about what that would look like if I were to try and get involved in that scene. And, and I came up with this idea of like, this was the th first thing that popped into my head, that someone's got a bunch of C++ on a bunch of boxes, and they're using some kind of C++ API, like OpenMP. And I thought, oh, the, kind of the first things that popped into my mind were like, that's very bespoke. There's like a, a high barrier to entry and it sounds expensive. And I started thinking like, could we take like something that I've written on my laptop in Node, just write some Node, and just kind of do something to it, just to make it scale across boxes and processes, and just do it, do it for me? Um, so that's kind of where where this project went. Um, I'm going to set your expectations now. This is powered largely by hopes and dreams. So don't be like, oh god, this is amazing. It, yeah, it's pretty. It's good. So I've got I've got five steps. <laughs> Uh, the first step is like very basic. I'm going to move on to kind of the approach that I've taken. I'm trying to avoid code. Like there's a repo on the last slide with all the code in it and the slides. Um, so onwards. Step one: multi-threaded node. Multi. Anyway. So how do you do multiple threads in Node? Uh, so the answer is the cluster module, which ships with Node by default. And the very basic example looks something like this. So you load in the cluster module. Can you guys read that at the back? Yeah, okay, cool. I got ridiculed for making the font huge at work, by the way. <laughs> so I'm glad. <laughs> uh, so the, the, the premise is you require this module, you call cluster.fork, and at, at this point, a new process is spawned, and that process starts from the top and goes back down again. Uh, so this example doesn't technically work, because the second process will fork and fork. And so you have to do something a bit more like this, which is what you'll see everywhere. Um, so the idea is that the first process will be the master, and it will fork and it will print ready, and the next process won't fork, and we're good. Um, so that will give you two Node.js processes. Um, but obviously, when you're running this on like some kind of eight-core machine, you want eight cores. If you're running it on a quad core, you want four cores, and so on. Um, so if you look in the OS module, which also ships with Node, it will tell you how many processes, processors are available for you to use, uh, which is wonderful. So you can just plug that into a loop, and voila, you can have a number of the a, a decent number of JavaScript processes running. So the next challenge, moving data between processes. All right, so here's the situation. You've got, you've got two processes, and you've got some kind of data, and you want to move it from one to another. Like how, how hard can that be? Like in a browser, I'm sure there's some kind of library for web workers where you can just move an object. That's n you don't get that in Node, sadly. So my first thought was, let's check out this cluster module, see what it actually does. And they offer up this solution whereby you kind of you have this kind of send message and on message uh, pattern going on. So the master can send a message to a worker. Workers can send messages to the master and backwards and forwards. And I thought this is almost too easy. This isn't really worth shouting about. So I decided to benchmark it. So I uh, I, I set up this little rig which would take one megabyte of data and it would send it off to a worker. The worker would read that one meg of data and send it back to the master and we'd loop it a hundred times and we'd see what that, that performance looks like. And it turns out that calling that with worker doing that with worker.send takes about 12 seconds. Uh, if you work that out, that is about 16 megabytes per second, which is unfortunate. Uh, if you, well, so to put this into perspective, if worker.send takes 12 seconds, like if I were to write that data into Redis instead, which is what I did next, that takes five seconds. So it's easier to send it off box than it is to, anyway. Uh, so, f so this got me thinking, like, what other mechanisms are there to send data between two distinct processes? Uh, so the next one I tried was a file system to write it to disk. That is even quicker. Wonderful. Uh, the next obvious choice was a TCP connection, and that is even quicker, which is good. 
I went off on a bit of a tangent on the next one, and I started messing with like temporary file systems. So it, on Linux, you can have a file system which exists entirely in RAM. Uh, so I mounted a folder in RAM, and I started pounding that instead. That's even quicker. Wonderful. <laughs> Who'd have thought? Um, and from there, I, uh, after lots and lots of trawling Google, I turned up Unix sockets, uh, and they are even quicker. And this is as fast as I could get it to go. And that equates to 826 megabytes per second, which is getting nearer to what you would want. It's not ideal, but it's better than, better than nothing. So if you're going to send uh, data between two processes locally, you want to use a, a Unix socket. And if you're sending data across a network to a different box, you want to use a TCP channel. Uh, looking back on this work, when I was putting these slides together, I Googled it again, and someone's actually made a module which just does all of this transport layer for you. So I would recommend you'd start there. Don't look at what I've done. <laughs> it's filthy. <laughs> Ooh, we good? Uh, so from this, so from now, we know how to spawn multiple workers, and we've got an idea of how we're going to send data between them, either on the local machine or across a network. So the next question is, how do you send like some kind of complex JavaScript object and not just some kind of one meg buffer? So uh, you've got two workers, and the workers can communicating over some kind of channel. And you, on one side, you've got some kind of rich JavaScript object. And you want to kind of move that object into another process and just let it carry on its computational ways. Um, and this is surprisingly difficult. If you go on NPM and you search for serialize, you'll find at least <laughs> all of these. And the list went on. I was like, I'm done. This is enough to prove my point. But like, there's, no, there's no clear solution to how you should serialize JavaScript objects. And I started thinking about why. Like, why is this not a solved problem? Uh, so I started simple. I started with the circular reference, the bane of everyone's existence when you're writing logs. Um, so the idea is that you have an object, and the object contains a reference to itself. You try and JSON stringify it, and it's <laughs> you can't do that. It just doesn't work. Like if you try and go deep, um, so you can work around this, right? You can replace, you can iterate through your object and pull out all the circular references and replace them with like paths and like string formats, and say you find it back there, and you can w you can work around that. Uh, the next example, if you have an object which contains two properties, both of which represent the same object, so if I were to modify B dot first, I'm actually modifying B dot second. Uh, when you serialize that, you, it, it, you get two objects, and then they become two distinct objects on the other end, and it kind of breaks. But you can work around that as well by manipulating the tree, working it out, and lining them all up. Another one is the moment. Does anyone here use moment? Yeah, cool, it's awesome. Uh, it's awesome in a cool way, because like when you stringify it, it gives you a date string, and not an actual moment object. So it's, it's I can see why they did it, but at the same time, it gets in the way. So any time like, an object overrides dot to JSON or so on, like, you have to kind of, you can work around that. You can take it out. You can stringify it and put it back in again. <laughs> it, it got messy. <laughs> uh, another example, when you have like prototypes going on, so you build an instance of my class, and you console log or you JSON stringify it, you lose all that prototype information. So like rebuilding that, you c again, you can rebuild it. You can add extra things to the object to say that you can find the prototypes here, here, and here create these and bring the attributes into the right place. And you can just about rebuild those. The real problem comes when you look at closures. Uh, so I've got an example on this next slide, which is something that you will never be able to serialize. Uh, so on the left is a function called get data, bu get data buffer. And the idea is that well, the first time you invoke it, you pass it a number. And it will keep that number and hold on to it. And the next time you call it with the next number, it will then return the first number. So it kind of maintains state within this function. This little variable here is just kind of, it's not attached to anything, it's just hanging. So when you kind of, sh well you, there's a use case down there. But when you try and serialize whatever this is in, you will lose this state, because there's no way of gaining access to it. And I think that's the reason why like most of NPM is, uh, no one's really solved serialization. So you can serialize anything you like, as long as you kind of keep it functional and make sure that you pass all your objects around so you don't leave anything. There's a lot of gotchas, basically, which is why this is powered largely by hopes and dreams. So, uh, so uh, I've got a module which kind of does all the hacks that I just talked about, so I've got that for a demo in a minute. Um, so let's just assume that we've got two workers now. We've got, they could be local, they could be remote. They can send data between the two of them. We can serialize data. We can serialize complex objects. Ta-da, right. Step number four, how do you schedule tasks? 
So there's a worker. Imagine there's a worker, and that worker has six work units, and it needs them to be done somewhere. And it doesn't really care who does them. It just cares that something processes them in as parallel a method as possible. Like how do you go about scheduling this without getting too involved? My first thoughts were, this sounds really complicated. Well, maybe I should just give up here. This then I started thinking, like, how do you approach this from like an infra infrastructure perspective? Like, if you've got some users and they're sending six requests and you've got some hardware somewhere, like, you, all you do is you stick a load balancer in front of it, right? And the load balancer will just send your requests to, to places. Um, and when you think, if you look at uh, how the node cluster works, when you fork, the, you, you get two new processes, or one new process alongside the original. They share the same file descriptors. So if I go to the documentation for the cluster module, they will say that the cluster module supports two methods of distributing incoming connections. So if you have a cluster, a local Node.js cluster and you send a request to it, it will load balance that request for you. So if you can turn all your requests just to do work into HTTP requests or whatever, and you can just let everything fix this for you. Um, so you, at a high level, if you want to get work done, you can send it to a generic HTTP load balancer and it will distribute it somewhere. And at uh, like a box level, if you send a request to a box and it hits a node cluster, it will distribute it to a a worker. So the bigger picture is starting to look like this. Uh, so at the top we've got our HTTP load balancer. You can talk to it. You can start. You talk to it as like the starting point for your request. It will send your request to a box somewhere. That box has a cluster running on it, which will pick a worker and send that request to a worker. The worker can then decide if it wants to do the processing itself or send it up to the local, the local cluster, which will then pick a different worker on the same machine or it can talk up to the load balancer, which will pick a different box to do your work for you. So that's coming together. Step five. Uh, I'm gonna, for step five, I'm gonna jump to the end. This, this is called distributing complexity. So this is how you go about breaking up a running application into chunks of work to send to other places. And I'm, gonna I'm gonna jump to the end. So this is how it works, the demo that I've got. So you start off with an app and you develop it locally and it kind of works. You're happy with it. You then add three lines of code to it. You add a require and a return and a, an addition of some kind of load balancer. Um, and from that point, your app will just magically spawn some appropriate number of workers. Those workers will then start benchmarking, like how fast is it to send data from this worker to an adjacent worker on the same machine? And how, how much like, delay is there between sending a request from me up to the load balancer and back down to another worker. So you get an idea for performance, like if something's gonna take like 50 milliseconds up and down, then you've got a task which takes 20 milliseconds, you should just do it. But if it's gonna take two seconds, you should just fling it over the fence and like, someone else can fix this for me, like make, do, make it happen. So from there, you have to, well, it does run through all of the functions in your program magically, and it will start monkey patching over the top of them. And it will monkey patch them so that the first time that they run, it's going to benchmark every single function. And it's going to work out if a callback was provided and if the callback was invoked. If therefore, is it an asynchronous function? It's going to work out how long it took to run. Okay, is it easier to give it to someone else or should I just do it myself? And it's going to work out if it's blocking, if it like, mutates this. You know, a bunch of things that kind of break the idea of giving it to someone else. Uh, and as a result of that, we're going to know if that function should either be run locally or if we should run it by another worker on this box, or if we should just chuck it to someone else and get someone else to do it for us. Uh, so from there, the next request in is just gonna go boo, and off it goes, and it's just gonna scale. And all you have to do is add new boxes behind the load balancer, and the load balancer will just start sending requests to it. So there's no real, I was, I was pleasantly surprised with how neat it turned out. Uh, so how do you monkey patch an entire project? Uh, so <laughs> if you go back to basics, right, this is like the, the hello world of modules. So you, all you have is one line in your file and it says module.exports equals hello world. And it's something that I'm sure every, anyone, that, well, anyone that's touched Node will have used. But how many people here have a look to what the module actually is? A couple of people, a couple of people. So if you console.log what the module is, you'll find it's like not just some kind of funky thing that floats around. Uh, you can see it, it's got uh, an export which you write to. So my code drops in here. There is a parent reference, which is a reference to another module object, which is like where it came from. So like, at the very top of the tree, there will be no parent, because it will be the module you started. And then you have this tree of nodes, um, where every module has a list of children nodes. So every time you require a new module, it gets dropped in here. 
and that module becomes new one of these objects that has an exports and it loads more children and they have parents. So you can you can basically walk the tree. <laughs> uh, likewise, the require function, you can look at that as well, and that does a very similar thing in terms of there is a require.cache and it maintains a list of paths to every module that you've loaded and the module reference. So you can iterate through this object and you'll have every required module in the project, regardless of if like it's some up, up one folder, left two folders, down three folders. Um, and you can, just like writing a unit test, you can reach into those that exported object and just change the behavior, completely change it. So you <laughs> I had a proof of concept which disabled SQL, uh, SQL uh, you know, with a question mark where you write a query string, whatever you call it. You say like, if you required this module in, it would browse to the top of the tree, browse down the tree looking for this, the MySQL module, and it would change the query function. So it would just automatically blindly drop arguments into the query string without escaping any of them. And like that, it does actually work. It's <laughs> filthy. It's, yeah, don't do it, but it's filthy. <laughs> uh, so that's the process I went through. So at the end of the day, I've got a demo whereby I've got a single app server which I can run locally, and it takes like it takes forever, and I can add three lines of code to it, and it will become this, and I can show you that kind of working. Bear in mind it is powered by hopes and dreams, so it kind of works. <laughs> cool, right, uh, the, I'll leave this up, but that's, uh, that doesn't look great, but that's the, the, all the code and the slides are up here. So, where's my VM? Please be there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, right, uh, can you, should I make that bigger? Can I make that bigger? Uh. <laughs> is, is that better, top one? Just about? Okay. Uh, right, so at the top I've got uh, a reset command, a node server. So I'm going to run this server. It's going to listen on port 8000. That's just me doing some stuff. And down at the bottom I'm going to do a curl. I'm going to curl. There it is. When point. Um, the curl is going to go, and this is going to. This is doing stuff in the background. I can show you what it's doing whilst we wait for it. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, so we have a function uh, called slow computation, which tries to compute a very large number by multiplying very many numbers together. It takes absolutely ages, and it's kind of in a big async parallel, so it just kind of. They could all happen differently, but they don't. Um, we're passing in moment objects and just crazy things just to prove that you can pass around date objects. Uh, I'll just get in. There we go. So this took 15,000 milliseconds, 15 seconds. Uh, if I drop back into the code, uh, you'll see these wonderful three lines up here. Whoop, I'm going to drop these back in. Uh, so I'm requiring this module, and the act of requiring is going to go off and spawn more processes and monkey patch everything and set up all sorts of ports for inter-process communication. If it's the master process, it's going to stop, otherwise it's going to get confusing, and setting up the localized load balancer. If I was to put like an actual load balancer in there and spawn up more boxes, it would go sideways, but I figured in a demo it's dangerous. So <laughs> uh, Where are we going with this? Oops. Okay, uh, save. Over here. Show that. Show that. Reset. Load server. Oh, there we go. Right, so at the top here, you can see there's now a number of things listening on port 8000. Uh, you can see all of these workers are looking at some of the functions they can find. Uh, so we've got some moment functions. Here's my slow computation functions. We've got more moment stuff. Uh, scroll down a little bit further. So uh, they're looking at all of them, and they're th this section here is where they're benchmarking the, the time it takes between to talk to themselves and other processes. And put some white space in there. Ooh. Where are we going with this? All right, so if this time when I cut it, whoa. Scroll up. All right, so my request landed on Worker 3. Worker 3 tested this function, and it deemed the cost to be 700 milliseconds, it deemed it to be safe. 700 is cheaper than the 400, so it figures I'm just gonna chuck it over the fence. And you can see Worker 3 requesting all of these against the local host domain. Uh, and it, it asks for like 20 requests. And under that, you'll see all these other workers picking up those work units and processing them. 
and they should all come back at the end. There we go, it took five seconds. Yeah, three times quicker. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> cool. Uh, so there we go. It's, is there a GitHub link next? I think there is. Is there? I have a question slide. I can go back to the GitHub link if you're interested. Are there any questions? Go for it. One sec. In the output, you had uh, multiple listening on 8,000. Um, you can't listen on the same port. Multiple processes, maybe? W what was that all about? <laughs> uh, so the behind the scenes, this module that I'm requiring in picks like a high port number, and you don't see the Impton process communication going on. That 8,000 is just something that I picked. Um, so I the the, th the actual process that I'm running starts the server on port 8000. Like it doesn't need to start a server; it could run it off the command line. Um, so yeah, it was just for demo demo ease, shall we say? Yeah, go for it. Uh oh. Hello. I noticed you were basically calling a single function. Were you calling it once? Were you calling it many times over? Okay. <coughs> okay, uh, so th this, this server uh, is just here for demo purposes, right? So we call and create server, and there's no routing layer. It just says if we get a request and it matches go, that I'm stops the go. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, but this calls uh, task.compute, right? And that's the entry point to the other file. Uh, and task.compute is this. Uh, so we we call this file function once, once per request, and this will proceed to call slow computation 20 times. Okay. And it's this function down there, which is the one that is safe to fling. Is that okay? Yeah. Cool. I think we, yeah. <laughs> shall, I, shall I repeat the question? Yeah, do that. <laughs> Uh, what happens if the function takes a variable amount of time to run? Then you might get lucky, you might not get lucky. Uh, ultimately, like the cost between sending uh, data between between thread processes isn't that high. Uh, the numbers that you saw were for sending fairly large payloads. So if you, I picked 100 kilobytes, it's just uh, plucked a th number out there. I thought 100 kilobytes sounds like a good idea. <laughs> um, so that's 300 milliseconds for sending 100 kilobytes, but every worker is also sending 100 kilobytes. So it's like a a heavy load scenario of sending data around. Um, so yeah, good question. Hopes and dreams. <laughs> That's all I've got. <laughs> cool. Yep. How do you stop workers from constantly throwing the tasks back into a pool so the file will come straight back in with the data in it? Uh, I don't think I got that far. So ultimate. Uh, okay, so I, I assume the the use case you're thinking of is if I call a function which takes 700 milliseconds, but that does something which does something in 600 milliseconds, and it's like someone else deal with it, well and that moves on, and we chuck it. Yeah. So it basically looks. If are, are the parameters safe to serialize? Um, are you like if you start mutating this, it becomes much harder to send stuff around because everyone assumes this has like a some kind of counter on it or something. Uh, it looks at if there's a callback. It's, it's quite crude, shall we say. Hopes and dreams. <laughs> 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 cool. <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs>